fun thing. What's the one thing that you want people challenged by pain to know about? Um, so I guess I'm going to be a little bit disruptive to start with, Josh. I'm going to just change the question a little bit. Because I think what I'm interested in is not what people, what I want people to know about, but actually what I want people to discover. And I think that works a little bit better with how I work and, and think about um, pain. And I guess the thing is that, um, that I want people to discover, the one thing I want people to discover is that um, pain is a whole person experience. And over the years, I've developed a bit of a mantra that um, pain is always complex, but sometimes it presents simply. And that really reflects, I guess, what we understand about all the contextual um, in, uh, things that uh, influence the pain experience. Um, but today I thought I'd sort of focus a little bit more on one aspect that I, I found really interesting, which is um, pain vulnerability. And this was presented in a paper by uh, Franziska Denk and um, Stephen McMahon and Irene Tracy. And essentially what they're saying is that um, over the lifespan, someone's um, protective system, their body's sensitivity, I guess, can actually be primed um, to, in a way that, so that they're actually more primed to experience pain. And I think that's really interesting because I guess a, a lot of effort has been um, focusing on the transition between sort of acute and chronic sort of presentations of pain. Um, but in fact, maybe what we're missing is what's happened before the pain even starts. And so I think that's really, really fascinating. Um, I guess that the, the um, process that I, I sort of follow is that um, I often talk to patients about this concept of an over-applied protection. And I guess with that, um, I'm thinking that uh, the person's system has got to a point where it's um, protecting more than it needs to be. And I guess that that's probably not the right way of putting it because I think there's always a need for why this, this protection exists. But certainly it's more than what it needs to for any tissue-based problem. Um, I guess that the, the, the impact on the patient then, and why, like, why I think that's important for the um, person to, to, to discover this, is that when they realise that there's more than just a tissue-based um, uh, influence on their pain, they actually can um, find new ways of developing um, or, or managing uh, their pain and, and uh, addressing the, the pain concerns that they have. Um, so yeah, that's probably the, the overview of it. Um, and uh, would you like me to sh share an example with you, Josh? Because I've got yeah, I, yeah, I'd love to hear how do you how you explain that to a patient? Because um, I guess one of one of the things that I use is the pain and movement reasoning model, which is a, a reasoning tool that I developed with Des O'Shaughnessy. And often I'll present that to to the patient as as part of the pain education process. And so um, if we can perhaps share an example of a, a man who I um, saw, he's in his 60s, and he was basically having some difficulty with, um, uh, well, he was frustrated, I suppose, that people really hadn't been able to explain his pain to him. And he probably had a very pathoanatomic sort of view of pain, which I guess is normal because from an evolutionary perspective, that's how our pain system set up to sort of persuade us to look after the part that's vulnerable. And I guess um, his um, frustration was, um, uh, really like he'd been to many, many sort of uh, physiotherapists and doctors to try and unpack what was going on. And uh, yet, he, yet he still couldn't understand it. So with this process, what I'd normally do is um, I'd sit down with someone and I'd say, um, so this is how I understand pain. And then I just sort of explain um, sort of uh, the components of the pain and movement reasoning model, which consist of um, sort of local uh, issues around the, the tissues themselves and and usually being able to feed in what the person's told me in their history in the history taking can be really helpful there so with this guy I was able to um, include his understanding of his pain in that story um, and then we talked about um, sort of perhaps some of the more um, uh, biomechanical or regional issues as we, we call it in the model and um, and then finally we talked about um, the the more central modulation influences. And I could see that he really started to engage with that. And um, that was um, probably followed by one of those really nice long discussions where you just feel privileged as a clinician that someone's sharing deeply their story with you. And um, he, uh, he basically explained that, you know, he, in his childhood, he was um, 
uh, suffered quite a lot of poverty and, and bullying as a result of that. And he, he reflected that he really finds that he still gets quite upset about that stuff, even though it was many years ago. And um, so I guess as part of him discovering this new way of thinking about pain, or at least identifying that there were these other influences that um, were about him as a whole person, um, it meant that he was then able to start to um, suggest himself, you know, come up with plans himself about how he might be able to manage this. And so his, his suggestion was essentially um, to, uh, that he felt his pain probably wouldn't improve very much until he started to address those, those issues from his childhood. I guess that um, for me, uh, when he came in, in the door that day, he was, he was um, uh, in a, uh, feeling helpless and hopeless, I guess. And I guess by giving him a new way of thinking about pain and, and helping him to discover um, this, this uh, I suppose, new knowledge, I guess, he, was, uh, he left being hopeful. And I think that's really important that we, we sort of at least can make that transition with someone so that um, they can uh, feel a bit more optimistic when they, they leave our clinical practice. I think this is the fascinating thing with... Um, yeah, once you once you sort of start to understand that there's so many other influences, the you know the contextual influences, your brain, you know, I guess um, there's a, a, a physio who a physio colleague I used to work with at La Trobe, uh, Sarah Baradell, who's done some great work on threshold concepts. Essentially, what it's saying is that threshold concepts are the point where you um, can't go back. Once you've changed your knowledge about something, you can't go back. So once you, for example, and, and the times that I've used that, it's probably with pain. It's probably once you realise that um, pain is constructed by the the brain and other sort of experiences or contexts, um, and it's not in your tissues, then you can't go really go back from that. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it, it's <laughs> once you understood that and and accepted that, you can't go back the other way and so that's an example of a threshold concept that oh, wow. you know you know once you get there you can't go on so i guess that's the, that's the thing that i wanted to share today that um essentially that i feel that if we can help people discover that pain's a whole person experience then um wider opportunities arise i think for for how their pain is managed and, and uh, addressed fantastic thanks so much for that lesson that's really informative thanks for your time no problems. All right. See ya. Yeah. Recent. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think the use of behavioral experiments is, is to me almost essential education. You know, I think that, yeah. and that's why, that's why physiotherapists are in such a privileged position for, for that role, because we can then um, give people safe places to try things. You know? Yeah.